colleagues, friends and guests, I'm really delighted to welcome you on behalf of the School of Law and the Global Justice Academy to the Ruth Adler Lecture and we're particularly pleased to welcome Mike and Sue Adler and their friends and family. The Ruth Adler Lecture has become a highlight of the human rights calendar in Edinburgh and beyond and also very much a highlight of the School of Law year. Ruth Adler was a School of Law colleague she was a feminist human rights campaigner and child welfare advocate, the founder of Amnesty International Scotland office as their first employee in Scotland in 1991. She was also a founding member of Scottish Women's Aid in 1974 and helped establish the Scottish Child Law Centre. Her own parents came from Germany to Britain as refugees in the 1930s. And on her death, it was written, I think, in one of the um, most amazing phrases that she was driven by three passionate concerns for justice, for children and for her family. To these she brought a formidable intelligence, unflagging energy, extraordinary determination and above all generosity of spirit and loving kindness. These passions were to touch the lives of countless people and tonight of course they're touching our lives too. In her honour, I'm very delighted to welcome to deliver the lecture, Philippe Sands QC. He's a British and French lawyer at Matrix Chambers, where the School of Law has many um, friends. And a specialist in international law, he's well known for his work in the area of human rights, both lawyerly, scholarly, um, literary now, and as a, as a, and active. Uh, he has particular expertise in the area of international criminal law, and in 2018, he was appointed president of English Pen, and it perhaps seems uh, a pretty appropriate week to be talking about protection of writers. Um, so I would really, without more ado, I cannot think of anyone that really makes the connection both to Ruth's life and work back to the 1930s, um, back to the period where um, H.G. Wells from Penn expelled German Penn for its refusal to admit non-Iran writers to its membership. And I think we're really lucky to have him here tonight. Uh, and I welcome him here to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. And it, 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 you're not lucky at all. I love coming to Edinburgh. Uh, <laughs> any excuse uh, I have with my family spent many, many happy days here. It's incredibly nice to have friends. Uh, here in the audience. It's also a real privilege uh, to give this Ruth Adler memorial uh, lecture. I didn't know Ruth, uh, but I did know about her work and I did know about her commitment to causes that were extremely important for her. Um, I did know about the work that she did with Amnesty. Uh, and so I feel very touched and very honoured to be standing with this wonderful group today in this fantastic university. I've long come to understand that the activities that I'm involved in, teaching, writing, and litigating, are activities that are very much informed by my background, by the baggage that was attached to me when I came into this world. Each of us has our baggage attached to us. I was not a blank slate. None of us are blank slates when we arrive. In his very fine autobiography, Interesting Times, the wonderful historian Eric Hobsbawm recognised what he saw as a complex connection between who we are and what we do. He noted, as he put it, the profound way in which the interweaving of one person's life and times and the observation of both help to shape our historical analysis. I'm, of course, not a historian. I'm a lawyer, and I'm a lawyer who focuses mainly on matters international. And my professional and academic activity is directed to a desire to understand how the law functions, how rules come into being, how they are interpreted and applied, how they affect the behaviour of all international actors, from individuals to governments, international organisations, and states and corporations. But my curiosity about a person's life and times concerns the way it might inform that world. And the experience of the past quarter of a century in my work, not least, I have to say, in the courtroom, 
appearing before international judges from so many different backgrounds points to a rather clear conclusion that individual lives and personal histories really do matter and they really can make a difference. East West Week took nearly seven years to write and it's not about the life of one person but of four individuals and it seeks really to understand in a sense the particular circumstances of each uh, and how those circumstances contributed to the roads that the four men took and how the roads each travelled and collectively travelled changed the system of international law that is my daily work. As many of you will know, the book also touches upon a much more personal theme, how the four interweaving lives of these men influenced my path, whether directly or indirectly. And below this path, mine and yours, lurk, of course, far bigger questions that I hadn't really appreciated when I wrote the book, but I've come to recognise having seen the reaction to it. Themes that touch each of us and will be of interest, I'm sure, to many people, if not all, in this room. A central question of human identity. Who am I? And how, principally, do I wish to be defined as an individual or as a member of a group or groups? And, for the lawyers amongst us or those interested in the law, how do we want the law to protect us? Do we want it to protect us because we are individuals or because we are members of a particular group? Those questions are especially pertinent today. As pertinent, I would say, as they were when the legal concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide were coined in 1945. Indeed, in just a few weeks' time, there will be an important celebration to mark the 70th anniversary of the signature in Paris in December 1948 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide signed in the very same spot on consecutive days. East West Street came about by chance, as does so much in our lives. It was the spring of 2010. I was immersed in my work, as, in my world of classrooms at UCL in London, writing academic articles, doing some cases in The Hague and other places. And an invitation arrived from the Ukraine, an email from the law faculty in the university in the city that used to be called Lemberg during the Austro-Hungarian Empire until 1918, and then Lvov for 20 years until 1939, the Polish years, and then Lviv after 1945. Would I like to come and deliver a public lecture on the cases I had done on crimes against humanity and genocide? the cases I'd been involved in, my academic work on Nuremberg, and the trial's consequences for today. I said I would. I'd long been fascinated by that trial, I have to say, the myths of Nuremberg, the words, the images, the sounds. The trial was totally catalytic. It was the moment when our modern system of international justice, such as it is, crystallised into being. And I was particularly mesmerised by odd points of detail that I would find in the lengthy transcripts, by the terrible evidence I was drawn to the books and the memoirs. Actually, the best writing on Nuremberg is by three women, Janet Flanner, Martha Gellhorn, and Rebecca West. By the memoirs, by the diaries, by the forensic detail of the testimony that was put before the judges. And, of course, fascinated by the love affairs that went on behind the scenes, which are not written about in our law books, but I think are very important. I was drawn to films, like Judgment at Nuremberg, which won an Oscar in 1961, memorable for many reasons, not least Spencer Tracy's momentary and totally unexpected flirtation with Marlena Dietrich, and the fantastic line from the closing scenes when he gives his judgment. We stand for truth, justice, and the value of a single human life spoken by Spencer Tracy. But there was also a practical reason for my interest, because of the trial's influence on my work. It had been profound. The Nuremberg judgment blew a wind into a germinal human rights movement. Sure, there was a strong whiff of victor's justice at Nuremberg, but there's no doubt in the case was catalytic. It opened up the possibility for the first time in human history that the leaders of a country could be put on trial 
before an international court. That had never happened before. It's probably my work as a barrister, rather than my writings, that caused the invitation to arrive unexpectedly from Lviv. In the summer of 98, I'd been peripherally involved in the negotiations in Rome that led to the creation of the International Criminal Court, a body that would have jurisdiction over both genocide and crimes against humanity, as well as two other international crimes. The essential difference between those two crimes is on who is protected and why. If 10,000 people are killed, murdered, exterminated, mistreated, the systematic killing of such numbers of individuals will inevitably be a crime against humanity. But will it be a genocide? In law, that depends on the intent of the killers and the ability of the prosecutors to prove that intention. To establish the crime of genocide in law, you have to show that the act of killing is motivated by a special intent, namely the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. If a criminal prosecutor cannot prove that a large number of people have been killed with that intent, then the crime of genocide will not have been established under international law. And so you have these two international crimes. Most people think they started yonks ago and are essentially the same thing. They're not. They operate side by side and they overlap. Every genocide will also be a crime against humanity, but not every crime against humanity will be a genocide. A few months after both crimes were inscribed into the statute of the International Criminal Court in the summer of 98, Senator Pinochet was arrested in London on charges of genocide and crimes against humanity, charges laid against him by a Spanish prosecutor. The House of Lords ruled that even though he was a former president of Chile, he was not entitled to claim immunity from the English courts because he had been involved in a crime against humanity, allegedly. That was a novel and totally revolutionary judgment, the first time it had ever happened. In the years that followed, after 98, the gates of international justice slowly creeped open after five years of quiescence during the Cold War chill that followed Nuremberg. Cases from the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda soon landed on my desk in London, and other cases followed in relation to allegations in Congo, Libya, Afghanistan, Chechnya, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Sierra Leone, Guantanamo, Iraq, Palestine, Israel, I mean the list just goes on and on. But all the cases were based on the same rules that came into being in those short weeks in the summer of 1945, a truly revolutionary moment in the making of modern international law. The moment when it was recognised for the first time that the sovereignty of states over its own people was not unlimited. The long and sad list of cases that reached me reflected obviously the failure of good intentions in courtroom 600 in Nuremberg. I became involved in many cases that involved mass killings. I have seen many mass graves. Some of those cases raised claims of crimes against humanity, others genocide, individuals and groups. But these two distinct crimes, with their different emphases on the individual and the group, grew side by side, seems curious. Although over time, crime of genocide seem to, seems to have emerged in the eyes of many as the crime of crimes. Somehow a hierarchy has been created, and this leaves the unfortunate suggestion that the killing of very large numbers of people as individuals is somehow less terrible. Occasionally I'd hit, pick up hints about the purposes, origins and purposes of the two terms, and the connection to the arguments that were first made in courtroom 600, but I never really inquired very deeply as to exactly what had happened in the run-up to and at Nuremberg. I knew generally how they'd come into being through the law books and how they subsequently developed, but I didn't know about the personal stories behind them or how they were argued, and the invitation from Lviv gave me a chance to do that, to research and explore that interesting history. Now, I could say that I made the trip to give the lecture, but that would not be accurate. I travelled for another reason, namely that my grandfather happened to have been born in that city of Lviv in 1904. He was called Leon Buchholz, and he called it Lemberg when he spoke in German, but Lwów when he spoke in Polish. 
In his wonderful slim volume, Moy Levuf, My Levif, My Lemberg, written in 1946 in New York, and published recently by Pushkin Press for the first time in English, I'm so very pleased to say, as City of Lions, the Polish poet Joseph Witlin describes the essence of being a Lvovian. For him, it is, as he puts it, an extraordinary mixture of nobility and roguery, of wisdom and imbecility, of poetry and vulgarity. But, he ends his book, nostalgia likes to falsify the flavours of our memory. It tells us to taste nothing but the sweetness of Lvov today. And, he ends, I know people for whom Lvov was a cup of gall. It was a cup of gall for my grandfather. It was buried very deep in his psyche, part of a hinterland of which he never once spoke to me or my brother. His silence barely covered the wounds of a family that he left behind in 1914 when he moved to Vienna and then lost forever after 1939 when the war broke out. But curiously, the very moment I first set foot in the city in the autumn of 2010, 80 years after he left, for the first time. It felt like a very familiar place. It's like meeting a long-lost relative. Somehow that dark city was part of my DNA. I'd missed it. It was there, and I felt very comfortable being there. Why I had that reaction, of course, caused me to explore other types of writing outside my expertise as an international lawyer, and in particular to explore psychoanalytical writings that address that complex relationship between grandparent and grandchild, something that is not much explored. I was directed by a friend in France, a psychoanalyst, to the work of two Hungarian psychoanalysts, Maria Torok and Nicholas Abraham. They wrote, what haunts are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And those are the words with which the book opens, because they reflect, I think, somehow what happened to me. My grandfather's secret, which I didn't know until I engaged in this exercise, was that he came from a huge family, one that was based in Lemberg and the surrounding villages. Literally dozens and dozens of uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and others, distant and close. That family grew and grew until 1939, when the war came again to the city. And within six years, by the spring of 1945, he was the last member of that family still alive, the only survivor from the city and from Galicia. At least that's what I thought when I wrote the book. A year and a half after the book was published, someone wrote from America to direct me to the story of my grandfather's first cousin, who had survived and spent the remaining 45 years of his life looking for anyone else who survived and never found anyone. You can imagine that letter touched me very, very greatly. Amongst my grandfather's papers, I found the expulsion order, which removed him from Vienna in 1939. I didn't see this until I was 50 years old. It says in English, the Jew Buchholz Morris Leon is required to leave the territory of the German Reich by December the 25th, 1938. The reason he could be expelled was that he had been made stateless. And I'm sure that is one of the reasons why, in recent years, I have felt as strongly as I do about the current fad in some countries, including this country, of reverting to the technique of stripping people of their nationality in order to treat them in a particular way. As we know, one thing leads generally to another. I had always assumed that my grandfather Liam had left Vienna with his wife, Rita, my grandmother, and his one-year-old daughter, Ruth, my mother. But in the course of that research, I learned that this wasn't the case. And I think it was this central fact, an unexplained family story, which lay very deep and which hung in the background of my childhood and my family story. Leon left Vienna and made his way to Paris by himself, not with his wife and daughter. But only gaining access to these papers was I able for the first time to understand that, to learn that his daughter, my mum, 
had travelled to Paris a few months later, in July 1939, and that his wife, Rita, my grandmother, remained in Vienna for three more years by herself. From this, I formed the sense that something else must have intervened in their lives before the three separated in January 1939. I had many questions. Why did Leon leave Vienna by himself? How on earth did my mother get to Paris by herself as an infant of less than a year? And why did my grandmother stay behind in Vienna, allowing herself, I think very difficult, particularly well, for any parent, but particularly for a mother, to be separated from her only child? What had happened? These were big questions, and they sort of hung in the air, as such questions do, once you've started asking them. I returned to the documents time and time again, looking for other clues amongst the papers and other materials I'd found. As a litigator, which is sort of a lesser amateur historian come psychiatrist, you do learn that every scrap of paper holds information that is not immediately knowable. It's the muck of evidence that many of us in this room absolutely love. We learn to keep an open mind, to look very carefully at everything again and again, to prepare for the unexpected, to find the dots, to try to join them, and we learn to persist, because nothing is ever only what it seems. And two items really stood out. This was the first. It's actually tiny. A scrap of paper, thin, yellow, folded in half. One side was blank. The other bore a name and an address written firmly in pencil. The writing was angular and it felt strong. <coughs> Miss E. M. Tilney, Norwich, Angleterre. The second item was a photograph, also tiny, a small black and white image taken in 1949, not quite square, a middle-aged man staring intently into the camera with a faint smile across his lips. In a pinstripe suit, with a neat white handkerchief folded into the breast pocket, wearing a clean white shirt. The polka dot bow tie somehow emphasised what I thought was a bit of a mischievous air. On the back of the photograph, in blue ink, was written the words Herzliche Grüße aus Wien, September 1949, warmest wishes from Vienna. And there was a signature, but it was completely indecipherable. But I first saw these images, I asked my mother what they were, and she told me she didn't know who Miss Tilney was or the identity of the man in the bow tie, and I didn't really believe her, but I didn't persist. I kept the scraps on the wall above my desk at home. I thought they might shed some light on what had actually really happened to my grandfather in 1939, and I turned to write the lecture for Levitt. I've gone off on a little sort of detour, but you'll recall the lecture was about the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide. So let me take you back to the first of several coincidences. In preparing that lecture back in the summer of 2010, I was very surprised to discover that the man who put crimes against humanity into international law came from Lviv. Not only that, but he was a student at the very university and law faculty that had invited me to deliver the lecture, and the folks who invited me were blissfully unaware of that fact. His name was Hirsch Lauterpacht, and he was probably the greatest international lawyer of the 20th century. He started off life in a small town called Zhukiev, about 15 miles north of Lviv. He moved to the city when he was 14, in 1911, enrolled at the University Law Faculty four years later, and in 1919 moved to Vienna, where he spent four years preparing a doctorate under the supervision of Hans Kelsen. He came to London in 1923 with his new wife, who was married, to study for a second doctorate at the London School of Economics, where he then got a job and eventually moved to Cambridge University. In 1945, he published a book that laid the foundations for our modern system of human rights. Titled An International Bill of the Rights of Man, it offered what was then a totally revolutionary idea. Every human being on the planet had rights under international law as an individual. That didn't exist back before 1945. He wrote 20 draft articles, 
which covered much that was new, but certainly not exhaustive. By our contemporary standards, there are notable omissions. There's no reference, for example, to the prohibition on torture or cruel treatment, or any obligation not to discriminate against women. There is a reference to freedom of expression, given the matters that um, Christine mentioned and which I talked about this morning on the Today programme with Lord Heseltine. But equally striking was his approach to the situation of non-whites, particularly in South Africa, and what he called, I quote, the thorny problem of actual disenfranchisement of large sections of the Negro population in some parts of the United States, end of quote. So they were aware that there was a problem, but they were also aware of real politique. It was necessary to allow these two countries, South Africa and the United States, to engage with an international bill, and that would simply have to be put on one side. But the draft bill that he wrote gave effect to his personal credo. The individual human being, he wrote, is the ultimate unit of all law, including international law, and that is revolutionary. In April 1945, after the war in Europe ended, Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin agreed that there'd be a trial for the senior Nazi leaders. The British hired Lauter Pact to assist in the prosecution to work with Robert Jackson, and in the summer of 1945, Jackson came to the United Kingdom to draft the Charter of the Tribunal. The four powers... America, France, Britain, the Soviet Union, couldn't agree on the definition of crimes over which the tribunal would have jurisdiction. Jackson drove up to Cambridge from London on July the 29th and spent the day with the Lauterpacks. They sat in Lauterpacks' garden of his house on Cranmer Road. Some of you know that road very well. They discussed the list of crimes. Lauterpacks suggested it would be a good idea to insert titles in the charter because that would help public understanding, and if public understanding was enhanced, there would be greater legitimacy of the judgments. Jackson reacted positively, and so Lauterpacht offered another idea in respect of atrocities committed against civilians, a matter on which the Soviets and the Americans were very divided. Lauterpacht had, of course, a long-standing academic interest in this subject, but he also had a personal interest, because he still had no news about any members of his family in Lemberg which, as a recent and emerging Englishman, he said nothing about that to Robert Jackson. Why not, he said, refer to the crimes, the atrocities against civilians, as crimes against humanity? These are those words written in Lauterpacht's own hand. It would cover atrocities against individuals on a large scale, torture, murder, disappearance. And it would also introduce a new concept into international law. Never before had a legal instrument used the term. Jackson liked the ideas, took them back to London, and a week later they had been integrated and adopted into the Nuremberg Charter. Article 6, paragraph C of the statute. An innovation, Lauterpacht told the Foreign Office, but a necessary and important one. They signal in particular these words that people who break international law cannot hide behind the shield of the law of their own country. <coughs> Preparing the lecture also required me to focus on genocide. This brought me to the second surprise. The second one was even more surprising, I would say. The man who invented that word in the November 1944 also passed through Lviv and also studied at the same university and law faculty as Lauterpacht. And again, the people at the university had no idea. 70 years later, they were amazed. His name was Raphael Lemkin. He arrived in Lvov in 1921, having been thrown out of the university in Krakow, two years after Lauterpacht had left, and remained there until 1926, when he obtained a doctorate in criminal law. He was actually born about 500 kilometres to the north of Lvov on a small farm in a hamlet called Azariska. That is now in Belarus. After law school, he became led, proposing a new list of international crimes, including barbarity and vandalism against people. Unlike Lauterpacht, Lemkin was concerned not on the protection of individuals, 
but the protection of groups. That's why people get killed, was his thesis. The ideas bounced around, the timing was pretty bad, Hitler had just taken power, nothing came of these ideas. In 39, when Germany invaded Poland, Lenkin was in Warsaw. He escaped, made his way north to Sweden via his parents' hometown of Volkovsk, which by then had been taken by the Soviets. In 41, he left Stockholm for America. He had to travel the long route because the Atlantic was basically closed. All across Russia, to Japan, by boat to Seattle, then a train to Durham, North Carolina, where he took refuge at Duke University. He traveled with a vast quantity of luggage, but no money and no personal belongings. That luggage was filled with paper, literally thousands and thousands of pieces of paper. The decrees he had collected in Stockholm, promulgated by the Nazis in the countries they had occupied, he had gathered these materials with a purpose. He wanted to cart them around the world, take them to America, study them, and see whether there was an underlying master plan to explain what was going on. He got a contract to write a book in 42. The book was published in November 44. It was called Axis Rule of Occupied Europe. And chapter 9 of the book had the title of a new word which he had invented, genocide. Again, you see it in Raphael Lemkin's own hand. It's his invention, the crime of the destruction of groups. Nazi master plan, an amalgam of the Greek word genos, meaning tribe or race, and the Latin word sido, meaning killing. In the summer of 45, Lemkin was hired by the Americans to join the prosecution team, also working with Jackson, but in a separate unit from that. He pushed his idea of genocide, the crime for which he wanted senior Nazis to be indicted. In his view, the destruction of groups, Poles, Jews, Roma and others was a matter for the Nuremberg Tribunal. August 45, when the Charter was adopted, he was hugely disappointed that it included crimes against humanity, but not genocide. Killing of individuals was in, but not the killing of groups. He took himself to London, he negotiated the indictment of the individual defendants, and was absolutely thrilled when it made it into the indictment, working with British French and Soviet counterparts. He was incredibly persistent in the face of very strong opposition from Robert Jackson's office, which came under intense pressure from Southern United States senators who were concerned that African Americans would use it in the United States, and the British too had their concerns in relation to its use in regard to the colonial legacy. But against the odds, it made it into the indictment. He was greatly pleased it was adopted. It included the ill treatment and murder of civilians as war crimes in occupied territories, including Lemberg and Volkovsk, where his parents lived. Like Lauterpacht, he had absolutely no news while he was doing all this work as to the fate of his own family. It alleged that the Nazis, the indictment alleged that the Nazis had conducted deliberate and systematic genocide, and this was the first time the word had ever been used in any legal instrument came with Lemkin's agreed definition, the extermination of racial and religious groups, specifically mentioning Jews, Poles, Gypsies, and others. It was adopted on October the 18th, 1945. A month later, the trial began. Lauterpacht was present in the courtroom for the opening of the trial. He was a member of the British delegation, and he was charged with pushing for the protection of individuals and crimes against humanity. Lemkin remained back in Washington with the American home team pushing for the protection of groups. One of the 22 men in the dock was Hans Frank. He became the fourth man in the story of East West Street. He too was a lawyer, attended extremely prestigious universities from the late 1920s, served as Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer from 28 to 33, an early supporter of the Nazi party. In 33, he became Bavarian Minister of Justice, and a couple of years later, at a big conference in Berlin, he set out his own credo, and I quote, community takes precedence over the individualistic, liberalistic, atomizing tendencies of the egoism 
of the individual. The words are perhaps not elegant, but you get the point. The words generated great attention, and in his case, of course, led to his involvement in mass killing. In October 39, he became Governor General of Nazi occupied Poland, and in August 42, he visited Lemberg and Galicia, recently incorporated into his territory. He brought an orchestra with him and a conductor and ensured that Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was played in advance to the speeches that he gave, which would announce the elimination of half a million people, the area's entire Jewish population. Amongst those who would be caught up in the terrible events in the weeks and months that followed his visit was, of course, the entire family of Lauterpacht and of Lemkin and of my grandfather's family. For each, there would only be a single survivor. And in this way, Hans Frank became the connector between those three lives. He, of course, didn't actually seem unduly bothered by what his actions would lead to. He was concerned with other mundanities. I did some work on the diaries of the wife of his deputy, Otto von Wechter, governor of Galicia. Some of you will be more familiar with him if you've listened to the BBC podcast series, uh, The Rat Line. And I'm working on the book now that will follow that and be published in 2020 as a sort of companion to East West Street. Otto Wechter's son, Horst, very generously shared with me his mother's entire diaries from 1929 to 1949. And I checked what her insert was on the 1st of August 1942 when Frank visited and stayed with them in Lemberg. She played chess with Frank for much of that day. And I quote, I won twice. After that, Frank went very angrily to bed. <laughs> then he came downstairs and drove away immediately. Three years later, in May 45, Frank had been caught by the Americans a little south of Munich, along with his diaries, 42 volumes, which were very central evidence in the Nuremberg trial, and a fantastic collection of artwork. And when I say fantastic, I mean fantastic. It included this famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci, from about 1489, which hung in his private offices. Some of you might have seen it in London when it was the centrepiece of the National Gallery's Leonardo exhibit about five years ago. It's now actually back in the Vavel Castle, and you can see it there. Frank's son, Nicholas, who I've also come to know, tells me that as a young boy, his father made him stand in front of this painting in his father's private offices and slick down his hair so that it was parted like Cecilia Gallerani. But in 45, Frank was in the dock and accused, charged both with crimes against humanity and genocide. On the very first day of the trial, the prosecutors from the Soviet Union took the judges to the specific events in which Frank was involved in Lviv. They described murders and other atrocities and over 130,000 people being killed in a matter of weeks, including about 10,000 children right at the heart of the city. As those words were spoken in court in the presence of Nautopay, though Lemkin was more distant, they did not know as prosecutors whether the numbers included their own family members. In fact, they weren't even aware that the man they were prosecuting, Hans Frank, was directly implicated in the then unknown fate of their own families. But on this day, November the 20th, 1945, for the first time ever, the terms genocide and crimes against humanity were used in open court. I knew, as I mentioned, Lauterpacht and Frank to have been in the courtroom on that day, and I wondered whether there was a photograph. Lauterpacht's son, Ellie, told me there was no photograph, but rather like my mother, I didn't believe him. I persisted, and a friend introduced me to the archive of Getty Images, and after a long days spent in the archives, I found hundreds of old glass plate images taken from that first day of the trial. And I found this image. In the top left-hand corner is Hirsch Bauterpacht on the British team table. He seems attentive, standing right behind the lectern. It's a Soviet prosecutor on that first day, possibly speaking about what happened in Lviv. If you go into the bottom right-hand corner, you see Hermann Goering moving forward in his famous white suit. And then if you go 
into the bottom right-hand corner, you can see Hans Frank. And that touched me very much, that semi-bowed head, imagining the two men in the courtroom on that same day, divided by nothing more than a few tables and chairs. The trial lasted for a full year. The judgment was handed down over two days, on September the 30th and October the 1st, 1946. I don't have the time, and I'm slightly reluctant to go into all the details, the remarkable details, of what transpired over the course of an incredible year in court, as the lives of the three men, Lauterpak, Lemkin and Frank, became increasingly intertwined on issues of fact and law. Suffice it to say that the connections were completely unexpected. I did not have a thesis that I was looking for. I stumbled across this completely by accident. The historian Anthony Beaver put it rather generously in reviewing the book. He wrote that no novel could possibly match the coincidences and connections that were thrown up by this story. The only point I'm making is that these personal journeys connected and coincided in ways that produced an outcome that changed the course of legal history, certainly international law, and then history itself. The ideas and endeavours of Lauterpacht and Lemkin influenced politics, history, culture, my working life, and many of your working lives as students and teachers and lawyers. The two concepts, crimes against humanity and genocide, entered our world, although many people that I speak to are under the impression that they have existed since time immemorial. They haven't. They are the products of creative, inventive human minds. Two men driven by their own particular histories and experiences forged on the anvil of a single city, Lemberg. Why Lauterpacht opted for the protection of the individual and what caused Lemkin to embrace the protection of the group is a matter of speculation. Their backgrounds were broadly similar. They studied at the same university. They even had, I've now found the student records, the very same teachers. Indeed, if you want to trace the origins of these two crimes, you can trace them not only to the city of Lembo, to the events at the end of the Great War, between 1918 and 1922 in the city, but to the law faculty. And you can go beyond. You can trace the origins to a single teacher, I mean, as a teacher of law, I love this, <laughs> who influenced the two men, a Polish professor of criminal and penal law, Julius Makarevich. And you can even trace it to the actual room in which they studied. Still a university classroom today, a hundred years later. I love this photograph. I love the fact that the benches haven't changed, the lights haven't changed. They're different students, of course, but that's the room that Makarevich taught in. There's also something else that's pretty remarkable. Despite their common origins, despite the common paths, interests, journeys, Despite the fact that I could locate them on some occasions in the same city on the same day, although not in Nuremberg or in courtroom 600, where they sometimes missed each other by a single day, one would arrive and you know, one would leave, it seems that Lauterpacht and Lemkin never actually met. That strikes me too as remarkable. But the concepts they put into international law inform my everyday working life, and I frequently wondered how it could be that I ended up doing the work that I do. My quest to understand Lauterpacht and Lemkin was surely driven in some way by my family's personal history and by stories and secrets that had been buried away in family crypts, no doubt for the best of protective reasons. During that quest, I conducted a great deal more family detective work, and I managed to find out who Miss Tilney was and exactly what she did and understand why my mother, my brother and I have reason to be deeply grateful to a truly remarkable and courageous human being, a missionary from Norwich in England who did work on behalf of a place called the Surrey Chapel into which she was born, motivated, it seems, by the sermons of her pastor, David Panton, and indeed a single sermon dealing with chapter 10, verse 1 of Paul's letter to the Romans. It could be said, it seems, that this single line is what motivated her to travel to Vienna and save my mother's life in the summer of 1939. This is an image 
of Miss Tilney that dates to a little earlier in 1923. She does indeed strike me as a very remarkable individual from the photograph. And I discovered the identity of the man in the bow tie. A journey that took me first to the east and then to the west, across rivers, across oceans. One thing we can do as litigators is we know how to find evidence. We're useless at a lot of things, but we can find evidence. Hundreds of old Austrian telephone directories. I hired a private detective in Vienna, but the answer eventually was thrown up amazingly by Facebook. And I ended up through in an attic in Massapequa, Long Island, about 40 miles from New York City, where I found an image that told, that unlocked the story. A photograph that offered a key to a family mystery. A single image taken in a garden in Vienna in the spring of 1941. My grandmother with two men in white socks. I wonder who in this room was aware that to wear white socks like that in the 1930s and 40s in Austria was a symbol of commitment to the Nazi cause. That was a clue to this image. One of them, the man on the right, was the man in the bow tie, and he was her lover. One discovery then catalyzed another, including the identity of the man who was probably my grandfather's true love, his best friend, Max. Efforts like this have unexpected consequences, and they take years, and they involve the assistance of a range of remarkable people to whom I am immensely grateful. They are, if you like, exercises in personal archaeological enterprise. Perhaps even more remarkably, and again totally unexpectedly, I learned of the more direct connection between my family and the Lauterpachs and the Lemkins. I was blissfully unaware of this, but was surprised to learn in this research exercise that my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mother, Amalia Flaschner Buchholz, was actually born and lived in the very same small town of Zhukiev in which Hirsch Lauterpacht was born. Even more remarkably, they were both born and lived on the very same street. You're looking at it. It's called Lemberger Strasse, which was described by the great writer Joseph Roth as East-West Street. The coincidence here was that Lauterpacht's only child, Ellie, was my first teacher of international law. In 1982, he became my mentor. In 1984, he gave me my first job as a research fellow in international law. We worked together for more than 30 years as barristers, as academics, blissfully unaware that we were connected to this very same street. It was only in 2014 that I learned that we shared this connection. And I then learned that Amalia, whose life began on the street of the Lauterpachs, ended in September 1942 on the same street as the Lemkins in the kingdom of Hans Frank. The last street my great-grandmother walked down was called Himmelfahrtstrasse, the street to heaven. It was the street that led from a railway platform at a place called Treblinka to the gas chamber. And she walked down that street on the 23rd of September, 1942. And one month later, remarkably, Lemkin's mother and father, Bella and Joseph, walked down the very same street and perished in the very same gas chamber. Amalia's life, in this curious way, was bookended by the Lauterpachs and the Lemkins, as is mine, albeit in a very different way. How do you begin to explain these kinds of points of connection? The starting point, of course, is Lauterpacht and Lemkin and the enduring relevance of their ideas today. The relationship between the individual and the group has been contested across the ages. I was very much reminded of this when I came across a letter written by Lauterpacht to his son Ellie as he prepared the closing arguments of Hartley Shawcross's speech at Nuremberg in July 1946. He just learned that his entire family had perished with the exception 
of his niece, Inca, and that the man he was prosecuting was responsible for their deaths. For anyone who's a litigator, imagine what that must have been like, a time of immense anguish and personal grief and professional challenge. He wrote to his son to say what enabled him to find solace was to listen to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and in particular, the Matthew Passion. At the very same time that he wrote that letter, Hans Frank, in his prison cell, was telling the US Army psychologist attending to him, Dr. Gustav Gilbert, who kept a diary and recorded it and then published it in 1947, that at this most trying of times, what helped him get through the experience of being a defendant in the trial was to imagine that he was listening to a piece of music. And you've guessed it. It was Bach and it was the Matthew Passion. How on earth do we explain those points of contact? How remarkable, I thought, when I first discovered that, that two men on opposite sides of the same courtroom would find solace in the same piece of music. I've come to understand the resonance of the work for Lauterpacht, who was completely fluent in German. The libretto of the Matthew Passion reflected Bach's emphasis on a pietist belief in the role of the individual. Every aria but one in the Matthew Passion is sung as ich, I. And the three landmark choruses are sung in the first person. Bach was effectively signalling a direct connection between the singers and God a bypassing of the group. For Frank, with his scathing disregard of the integrity of the individual, the connection to the piece of music is more difficult to understand, not least since many interpret the piece as a scathing attack on the Catholic faith to which Frank had converted just a year earlier following a failed suicide attempt in the summer of 1945. The Pack believed passionately the law had to concentrate on the protection of individuals. And I think he would continue to argue, even today, that Lemkin's invention of the concept of genocide had been practically useless and politically very dangerous. That it would replace the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of the group. And I have to say, my own work in the field of genocide cases concords with Lauterpacht's concerns. I have observed for myself how, by focusing on the protection of one group against another, there is a tendency to reinforce that sense of them and us in a psychological sense, to amplify the power and significance of group identity and association, which is both a source of sustenance and danger. How does this happen? In simple terms, because in seeking to prove that a genocide has occurred, in law you have to prove the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. And I've seen for myself how the act of trying to prove that tends to reinforce the sense of victimhood of the targeted group and hatred towards the perpetrators as another group. But, of course, I also understand what Lemkin was trying to do, and he was surely right to recognise the reality that in most, if not all, cases of mass atrocity, it is targeted not against individual human beings because of what they have done, but because they happen to be a member of a hated group in a particular moment in time or place. And Lemkin would say, and I think it's a powerful argument, that the law has to reflect that reality and that it must also recognise and give legitimacy to feelings that so many human beings have, perhaps all of us, of association with one or more groups. This profoundly strong sentiment was brought home to me recently when I wrote an article for the Financial Times magazine, a profile of a German psychologist, Dr. Jan Kisselhorn, who established the remarkable program to assist 1,100 Yazidi women and girls who had been enslaved, tortured, and raped by individuals associated with ISIS. He arranged for the program to bring them to Germany for medical and psychological treatment. Pause. This country has brought not a single one to the United Kingdom for an equivalent type of program. In his work, Dr. Kisselhorn identifies a connection between the future well-being of victims of these terrible crimes. And I have to tell you, to be 
with a young woman of 16 or 17 who describes to you what it is to be raped 500 or more times in six months is a truly shocking experience. But for Kizilha, one step to their future well-being is to evoke the possibility of justice being done at some point in the future. And for him, justice means a charge of genocide. And that was why he welcomed the use of the word by President Obama, by the European Parliament, although the British government opposed the use in relation to the treatment of the Yazidis, although the Westminster Parliament voted in favour of it. Calling it a genocide, Dr. Kizilhan told me, recognises the group's identity, recognises what is being done to the group, and recognises the right of the group to exist. And for him, crimes against humanity doesn't do that, and is therefore insufficient. And as he said that to me, of course, I understood what it was that he was saying. But I'm concerned about the hierarchy that seems to have emerged, one that puts genocide atop the list of horrors, so that mere crimes against humanity or war crimes are somehow seen as a lesser evil. If a president calls something a genocide, it's on page one of our newspapers. If it's called a crime against humanity, if it makes it into the papers at all, it'll be on page 13 or some such thing. That's the power of the word invented by Raphael Lemkin, and perhaps also of our sense of association with the group. What then is the enduring legacy of these two legal terms? As I've said, there was a tremendous period of quiescence after Nuremberg, five decades, catalyzed, open by the events of the former Yugoslavia and in Rwanda, and by the arrest of Senator Pinochet in London, the creation of the ICC, 9-11, many of the actions that followed, taking us through Afghanistan and Iraq into the world of ISIS and Yazidis and northern Iraq and Syria today. The crime of genocide and the idea that each of us as individuals has rights under international law were new, invented in 1945. The moment of creation was significant, revolutionary. It was an act of recognition. Sovereignty is not unlimited. The exercise of sovereignty is not unlimited. But, as we know, the killings have not stopped. And there is today, around the world, a poison of xenophobia and nationalism and populism coursing its way through the veins of many parts of the world, including Europe and including, I'm sorry to say, this country. The strong man as leader is back. I see that on my journeys to the central and eastern parts of our Europe, in Hungary, in the Ukraine, those of you who saw the film David Evans made for the BBC, My Nazi Legacy, me and the kids of Frank and Vechter, will have seen us in a faraway field milling around with people dressed in Waffen-SS uniforms, real Waffen-SS uniforms, celebrating in 2014 the creation of the Waffen-SS Galizia Division in 1943. I've seen it too on my journeys in making the podcast The Rap Line, travelling in Europe, in Austria, in Poland, even Albuquerque, New Mexico. It is hard, it seems, to avoid what is stirring and to avoid wondering where this is going to lead to. One significant change, of course, is that the generation that experienced the horrors of the 1930s, that lived through the Second World War, that knows why states came together after 1945, to create the United Nations, to adopt in this room in Paris in December 1948 a Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a Convention on the Prevention of Genocide, that generation is about to disappear. And with it, memory will be gone. You will no longer be able to, as I have had the great privilege of doing, sit down in a room and talk to someone who was in the Nuremberg courtroom or who was a lawyer or who somehow attended this meeting. Perhaps it is the disappearance of actual memory, of actual experience, that will allow our politicians to take for granted what happened in 1945. And it is impossible to go through the experience of writing East West Street and the various side projects that have followed, a sort of total immersion in the world of 1945, and not feel an acute sense of anxiety as to what is stirring. 
Of course, it's not exactly the same. Nothing ever is. But where would it lead to? A couple of years ago, Mr. Trump, as a candidate, called for a total and complete shutdown for Muslims entering the United States. All Muslims. The idea of targeting people not because of what they've done, not because of their individual acts, but because they happen to be a member of a particular group has a long, dark history. The writer Primo Levi, who spent a year in Auschwitz, put the point as crisply as anyone in the preface to his book, If This Is a Man, published in 1947. He wrote, many people, many nations can find themselves holding more or less wittingly that every stranger is an enemy. And when this happens, he continued, when the unspoken dogma becomes the major premise in a syllogism, then at the end of the chain, there is the concentration camp. What he's saying is one thing leads to another. Against this background, the idea of a travel ban based simply on a person's nationality or religion is troubling. Experience, recent experience, teaches us to know where such a beginning can lead, singling people out, not for what they might have done, but because they happen to be a member of a particular group. Closer to home, too, it is possible to smell a change in the air, this move to identity politics. Two years ago, the Prime Minister of this country told her party conference that if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. She has indicated, too, that if she could, she would take the United Kingdom out of the European Convention on Human Rights. One former mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, offensively evokes Adolf Hitler as a supporter of Zionism. Another former mayor of London, and then shockingly foreign secretary of this country, Boris Johnson, tells us that somehow the EU and Adolf Hitler had common aims. Brexit and Trump are, I'm sorry to say, a reflection of a new direction. That's then the context in which I oscillate between the views of Lauterpacht and Lemkin, between the individual and the group, between the realism of Lemkin and the idealism of Lauterpacht. And I can see, as you've heard, the force of both arguments and recognise the tension and the struggle between the individual and the group, between crimes against humanity and genocide. It's not one that will soon be resolved. And so international law today embraces both ideas. But we are at a very dangerous moment. Many of our politicians seem not to be able to recognise how precious was the settlement of 1945 and how vulnerable is the acquis that was created, one that has offered a foundation to international relations in our age. We cannot take for granted what was achieved back then. The threat to the multilateral global order and the rights of individuals and groups is a very real one. But the challenge is led by the principal country that founded that order, the United States, now directed by President Trump, is frankly a matter of the gravest possible concern. But the United Kingdom chooses to remain mostly silent, devoured as it is by the short-term quest for possible future trade agreements in the aftermath of a likely, but I have to say not inevitable, Brexit, speaks very loudly. But there are some positive developments. For example, at the International Law Commission of the United Nations, they are concluding the preparation of a new convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity to fill a gap that has existed for 70 years alongside the Genocide Convention. Amazingly, there is no such instrument. And there is a great deal of new thinking going on right now on how we might better enforce that which we have. The coming events in Paris on December the 10th, led, I think, by President Macron, which will take place in this room, allow a moment to celebrate the adoption of the two instruments that occurred exactly 70 years ago. That, then, is the context in which, if you like, I come to an end at East West Street, a long-ago site of mass killing, caught between two different poles, between my head and my heart, between my intellect and my instinct, recognising the need to value the inherent worth 
of every human being, but understanding too the pull of tribal loyalty and the essential truth of the notion that we are indeed haunted by the gaps left within us by the secrets of others, but also by the possibility that the mere discovery of such a haunting will not necessarily destroy us, but could actually make us stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite um, James Wolfe, the former Dean of the Faculty of Advocates and Lord, Ad uh, and Lord Advocate, to come and make a response. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. And it's an enormous pleasure to have been asked by Philippe and Christine to take part in this event to respond um, briefly to Philippe's truly remarkable uh, lecture. Uh, and. Um, perhaps to prompt some, some thoughts and to prompt, to prompt a conversation in which uh, I, I hope you'll also uh, join. Um, before I say something about Philippe's lecture, uh, I, I'd just like to uh, say something about Ruth Adler, who taught me uh, jurisprudence when I was an undergraduate at this uh, law school. Um, I think I, Philip alluded to this in his lecture, our, our teachers really matter to us. And Ruth's intellectual and moral qualities uh, have influenced my own thinking about the law. She was tremendously encouraging to uh, a then very shy young man, and I'm so pleased to the opportunity to rem remember her uh, here tonight. Uh, I'm also very pleased to be able to say a few words because I'm a fan of Philippe's uh, and of his writing. Uh, those of us who've read East West Street um, uh, uh, have all, uh, I'm sure, been moved by it, and those of you who haven't have got a treat in store. Um, it's been a privilege to hear your lecture, Philippe. Um, what you have to say is important uh, and speaks to us at this time. Um, when I first read your book, East West Street, it struck me that it contained two quite separate books. On the one hand, the story of your investigation into your personal family history, and on the other hand, a work of intellectual history, uh, looking at the genesis of the, the two concepts that you've spoken about uh, tonight. Uh, but I've come to appreciate um, just how powerfully the personal story um, illustrates your uh, broader theme, and, and I think your fundamental theme, uh, that um, the individual lives and personal histories matter. Um, after all, a personal story is an account of individual human beings, each of whom had a, a unique history. Um, you, remind, you remind us through the personal story that each human life has its own story, that no two are, are the same. And at the same time, through the personal story, uh, one cannot get away from the brutal fact that you are speaking of people whose lives uh, were persecuted, uh, and indeed people who were killed because of their membership of a, of, of a group. Uh, your lecture has powerfully illustrated, I think, the importance of ideas in history. We are only able to think about mass killings in terms of genocide and crimes against humanity because Lemkin and Lagerpacht furnished us with those terms. Uh, one needs to be able to name an injustice uh, if one is going to tackle it. And at the same time, you, you've illuminated how ideas may be the product of the circumstances in which they were generated. The atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis and their accomplices uh, cried out, one might think, for a characterization which reflected their nature as murderers. Yes, but as something more than murder. And one wonders whether one could ever have seen Nuremberg uh, as uh, proceeding simply as if it were a murder trial, even a trial for murder or on a mass scale. And uh, I was interested in the more fundamental revolution um, to which you also alluded, uh, the revolution in uh, thinking in relation to the protection of individual rights and the international uh, plane. And just as one has to be able to name an injustice in order to tackle it, perhaps one needs to be able to identify a right in order to invoke its, its protection. I was struck, though, by the extent to which you alluded to a disconnect between theory and practice, or at least to a delay in practice catching up with theory. 
you referred to the Cold War chill and observed that for, I think, five decades, the gates of international justice were closed. And um, the rap line, perhaps also, which is to be recommended to anybody who hasn't already listened to it, also perhaps illustrates how the imperative to hold people to account for their crimes is was in the post-war period sometimes subordinated to other objectives. And I wonder if that reminds us that ideas and the concepts, necessary though they may be, are not enough. Lemkin and Lauterpacht's ideas have to be picked up and applied by practical prosecutors at Nuremberg, and the protection of fundamental rights is only made real when it's given practical expression in laws, whether national and international, uh, in institutions, national and international, and in the work of individuals, organizations, and uh, institutions, uh, nationally and internationally. The, the, the protection of fundamental rights doesn't happen um, by chance or without uh, effort. And I suppose one of the questions I'm left with at the end of your lecture is whether to be left with a profound sense of pessimism. After all, your lecture is about mass murder, and it's a subject about you speak, which you speak with, with remarkable uh, equanimity. And you've reminded us that notwithstanding the revolution in concepts and in institutions of 1945, the killings uh, did not stop. And you've alluded to the cases in which you yourself have been involved, which illustrate just that. And at the end of your lecture, uh, you uh, pointed to some of the features of the current environment, uh, which uh, might uh, justify a sense of pessimism. But I wonder whether ultimately, uh, and I'd be interested in your reaction, whether ultimately um, uh, you, 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 you leave us with pessimism or with optimism. Um, you, 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 you've challenged us, I think, to reflect on the lessons for our own time of the history which you've described. Um, and even though every historical moment is unique and presents its own challenges, uh, I think you've demonstrated how history can provide us with lessons and with an inspiration. Uh, and uh, I think that you're challenging us, perhaps, to reflect on what our own personal response should be to that uh, history in the times in, in which we come to live. So, Philip, I'd like to thank you immensely for the lecture that you've given to us, the, uh, the thoughts that you have uh, uh, left us with.